Hello, everybody. Um, well, thank you for that introduction, and thank you for Julian for having me here. I um, can't see any of you because of the light, so sorry, I'm going to be squinting. Um, so my name is uh, Sandeep Singh Garawal. I'm a registered in geriatric medicine, and that means I specialise in looking after our oldest, frailest patients with the most complex uh, comorbidities. And I'm a junior doctor. I've got about two years left until I've finished my training, and I'm a consultant. Um, but until then, I'm a junior doctor. And I thought I'd give a talk about our National Health Service. And I'm not giving this talk as a, just a, do a doctor. I'm giving this talk as a, as a patient myself. And over the last 15 years, the NHS has saved the lives of my older sister, my mum, my daughter, and my wife. So I've, you know, medicine is my life, but actually it's given me my life. So we all owe our National Health Service to this chap, Nye Bevan. And in the most austere of times, you know, after the Second World War, Nye Bevin created the NHS. He was the health secretary. And everyone got this leaflet through their door. And essentially what it says is, this is your National Health Service, and it will offer free dental, nursing, and medical care to anyone. Anyone can access all of it or any parts of it. And it will relieve your money troubles in times of illness. And these are principles that I, I think every doctor I've ever worked with has always abided by, and they're still true today. But I think we have to remember what times were like before the National Health Service came into creation. And this gentleman in the middle, Mr. Harry Leslie Smith, he's 92 years old. He can touch his toes, so he's doing better than I am. And um, he, ge he gives talks about what life was like when he was a lad. And he tells us of in the middle of the night, you could hear patients screaming in their houses, wailing in pain because they couldn't afford morphine for their metastatic cancers. He tells us stories about how his 11-year-old sister had tuberculosis and her, his parents worked in the mines, they couldn't afford a doctor. So they had to send her off to a workhouse where she died by herself with awful symptoms, surrounded by other people all going through the same thing. She died without her mummy and daddy being there. And I think that really tells us why we need a National Health Service, because had the NHS have existed back then, he would not have had to go through that. <clears throat> but how is the National Health Service doing? You know, we always hear horror stories uh, everywhere. Well, this is a really busy slide, but essentially, if you look at the UK, we are number one for accessibility, for efficiency, for general care, the quality of care. And if you look where it says at the bottom, healthy lives, we're number 10, that sounds awful, but actually it's really good. It means more of our patients are living longer with really horrible diseases. And if you look at every, <laughs> they're surviving. <laughs> We're doing our jobs. <clears throat> but if you have a look at how much it's costing everyone near the country, we're amongst the cheapest health service in the entire world. So we're doing incredibly well. We're amongst the best, and we're amongst the cheapest. And I thought I'd introduce you all to my daughter. Um, this is Tara. She's just turned one. And I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the night she was born uh, just over a year ago. So um, I just finished my set of nights, and my wife woke me up and said, Sunday, I think I'm going into labour. And obviously, I'm new dad. I jumped out of bed, so I gained the luggage together. And it was a 28-hour labour. So we drove to the hospital that night, and... Uh, I was do you know, dosing myself with loads of coffee and Coke. Coke uh, it's Coca-Cola, not cooking. <laughs> um, and uh, when we got there, um, uh, you know, it was about three, four hours in, um, and it was three o'clock in the morning. I was tired, but I really needed to pee. My bladder was at the maximum capacity. It was the only thing I could think about was my beautiful girl and my bladder. So I said to my wife, look, you know, we've got a, at least a couple of hours left. Let me just go and pee, I'll be two minutes. My wife said, all right, she gave me that look. Uh, and I said, she said, fine, just be quick. And this is the hospital I used to work in, so I knew where the toilets were. So as, as I left the labor ward, and there were two labor wards opposite one another, um, uh, one of the nurse, senior nurses and a porter, I saw them running past with the cardiac arrest trolley. And the nurse said, Sunday, we need you right now. And she went into the opposite maternity ward. And I said, but my wife is in labor, but she was already gone. So here I am, kind of like hopping around and thinking, OK, now I, I need to do my duty, so I went. And there was another woman also giving birth, and she had a, a cardiac arrhythmia. Her blood pressure was really low. They had 
put out the emergency call, but the duty doctors were actually in any resuscitating another person. So, you know, I sorted her out, I stabilised her, I gave her all the right medication. Uh, I know our Secretary of State for Health, Jeremy Hunt, believes in homeopathy, but sadly my treatments were evidence-based, so the, the drugs worked. And, um, and she got much better, like, almost immediately. I waited for the doctors to come up, told them what had happened, and I went and used the loo. So you can imagine the reception when 30 minutes later I walked into my wife's room. She's mid-contraction. She's like, where have you been? So uh, I apologised, explained everything. So you can imagine my surprise when um, I saw this quote. Oops, there we go. <laughs> I saw this quote that Jeremy Hunt said, which said that his new contract is going to give back a sense of vocation and professionalism which is missing in today's NHS culture. Well, as far as I'm concerned, I displayed my vocation and professionalism that day. Um, when I helped save two lives, the you know, baby and the mum. But I'm by no means special. There are miracles being performed every day in our National Health Service, up and down the country, by nurses and doctors. But don't take my word for it. So what were things, what were things like in the good old days? Well, Henry, I'm a bit young for the 1970s. I, don't, I wasn't a doctor then. But Henry Marsh... So Henry Marsh is known as David Cameron's favourite surgeon. He's an eminent neurosurgeon and has done incredible work everywhere in the world. And he wrote a piece in The Guardian, and he said that when he was, when he was young, he did one in one and one in two. And what that means is he used to go to work in the morning, spend all day at work, all night at work, all day at work, try to get some sleep in between, and then go home to have a rest. And he said that he had no doubt that he made mistakes. And this is when medicine was a completely different entity. CT scanners didn't exist. MRI scanners hadn't been invented. You know, if you had a heart attack or a stroke, the treatment was bed rest for six weeks. So, and tiny hospitals were nearly as busy then. You know, they're getting 10% busier every year. So that's how hard they used to work then, but they made mistakes. And what Mr. Marsh said is scary, is frightening, because in today's culture, I wouldn't stand for mistakes being made because of tiredness, and neither would my patients. So, patient safety is at the forefront of what we do. And we're already seeing the hunt effect, which is, and I've seen it myself, I've had a, a patient who had dementia, and her daughter brought her in on Monday morning with severe septic shock and septicemia due to an infected leg ulcer. And I asked her daughter, I said, what, what happened over the weekend? Why didn't you bring her in then? And she said, well, it's because I thought there weren't going to be any doctors around because of what I'd been reading in the press. And even this week in the British Medical Journal, two cases have been published where deaths have been... It's considered attributable to the hunt effect, you know, patients not thinking that there were doctors available on the weekend, so delayed presentation. But let me put it to you as patients or potential patients or relatives of patients, if a surgeon looked at you in the eye and said, look, this routine operation I'm going to perform on you, say a gallbladder removal or knee, re knee replacement, there's a good chance I'm going to be really tired and I'm going to make an error during your procedure. But you've got a manager in the background saying, oh, don't worry, we'll make sure he's had plenty of rest. The surgeon saying, no, really, I've looked at my rotor and it's going to be awful and I might be tired and I might make a mistake. Would you want that surgeon cutting you open and operating on you? Because I know I wouldn't. Well, we've just, on the 17th of October, we had 20,000 doctors marching on the streets of London saying we are scared that this new contract is going to lead us to work unsafe hours and make mistakes and kill people. 200,000 plus people signed a petition saying they had no confidence in Jeremy Hunt as a health secretary. And, but Jeremy Hunt says, well, you know, Monday to Friday, hospitals rotate three times as many doctors than they do on a weekend, and I just want to move it around a little bit. And it sounds great in practice, but what Mr. Hunt doesn't realise is Monday to Friday is where we do all the boring stuff, all the routine elective stuff, you know, elective operations, audits, paperwork, clinics. Because I tell you what, there's not much call for a gout clinic at three o'clock on a Sunday morning. <laughs> and... By taking a doctor from a Monday, Tuesday and making them work an additional Saturday, Sunday instead, you're essentially just robbing Peter to pay Paul. And if you have a look at, this is my rotor. And you know what? From the 
Monday through to Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then the Monday again through to Friday, those 12 days, it's 118 hours that I've worked without a break. And those are only 118 rostered hours. It's, it's excluding the hours that I've stayed behind to talk to relatives if my patients are critically ill to make sure they've stabilised before I go home. And, you know, if Jeremy Hunt does want to take a doctor from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and put them on to the weekend, that's fantastic. But this was a set of nights that I did January last year. I picked them at random. And the yellow boxes with the LR stands for locum required. There, weren't, there wasn't a doctor available on that night. So on Monday, Tuesday, two of us did three doctors' work. On the Wednesday, Thursday, it was just me covering a hospital of 350 people for medicine. Surgeons had their own surgeons on call and whatnot. But for medicine, that was unsafe. And it happens day in, day out. So I'm not quite sure where Mr Hunt is going to get the additional doctors from, because in the UK we have such a crisis in retaining and recruiting doctors. It's so difficult. But obviously our MPs were all in it together, and they recently voted to have their hours cut. At 7.30 p.m., they all get a free dinner and a cab ride home, because it's very late for them. <laughs> um, but there are, Jeremy Hunt says there are 11,000 extra vets on a weekend. That's shocking. Well, this was the study from Professor Bruce Keogh. Um, Prof Keogh said there are 11,000 extra deaths on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. So not just the weekend. But it's not possible to ascertain whether these deaths are preventable and to assume so would be rash and misleading. The reason why is on a weekend you don't have palliative care. If you've got metastatic cancer and you're entering your final few hours of illness but you need more morphine, there, there aren't enough spaces in our hospices. So where do people go? A&E. And also people who have our, you know, complex conditions, dementia, heart disease, strokes, well, you know, they get ill and they sadly do succumb to their illness and that's not always preventable. But what Mr Hunt says is there are 11,000 extra deaths but he kind of doesn't read out the red underlined parts and that's called spin, not evidence. And this year, for the first time, this is taken from the UCAS website, there has been a 5 to 10% drop in the number of applicants for medicine across England, Northern Ireland, Wales, and Scotland. And what that means is, because of this contract, in six years' time, you're going to have 10% fewer doctors qualifying. So why aren't the BMA negotiating? I'm, I, I don't work for the BMA. I'm not a BMA employee or anything. But why aren't the BMA negotiating? It's because when they did try to negotiate, the Department of Health said, there are 23 points we're willing to negotiate on one. The other 22 points are fixed, non-negotiable. So when Jeremy Hunt says we invite the BMA back to our table to negotiate, it's a disingenuous offer. But we've also been told that come what may, in August, this new contract is coming into place. And that's what I call a gun to your head. You can't negotiate because that's not a negotiation. And by releasing things like, you know, 11% pay rise to the media as opposed to the doctors, that's called spin not negotiating. But an 11% pay rise is pretty good. I mean, you know, will that buy me my Porsche that I covered so much? No. And the reason why is, I make £2,200 a month, okay? It's not a bad salary. I'm not asking for more. I'm comfortable with what I make. And as I said, I'm near the end of my training. My house officers make considerably less. They make about £1,800 a month. Some of them have £50,000 student loans thanks to the £9,000 a year tuition fee. But So my £2,200 a month salary is made up of one third, 30% of banding, so that's the supplement I get for working weekends and nights. And the rest of it is basic pay, so 60%, 60-70% is basic pay. Mr Hunt actually made an initial offer of a 14.9% pay rise. He said, look, we'll get rid of your banding, you know, and we'll give you a 14.9% pay rise from your basic salary. So that'll put me up to about £1,900. But a couple of days ago, just before the ballot went out for strike action yesterday, Mr Hunt said, actually, I'm giving everyone an 11% pay rise, and he made this to the press. So obviously, it sounds like 11% pay rise, what are they complaining about? But if you have a look, that's still less than my current salary. And it means that doctors in the NHS will be getting a pay cut. We're not poor, we're not asking for more money. 
What we're saying is, when we do turn up and do a good job, don't give us a pay cut, because I don't think any doctor deserves to get a pay cut for turning up to work to save lives. So what's the future? Well, you are going to see protests. You're going to see more and more of them. And it takes a lot for a doctor to protest. Inherently, we're too tired. <laughs> and... And what you will get are doctors saying that tired and demoralised doctors make unsafe decisions, they make mistakes, and patients come to harm. So we're being actively recruited. In the last week, I've had four emails from Head Medical alone saying, please come to Canada, come to Australia, come to New Zealand. We'll even pay $15,000 for relocation expenses. I can't even claim mileage for going to do a home visit. Um, and you're going to end up losing a lot of your doctors, because as I said, already doctors are leaving. And we're not in it for the money, because otherwise we would have left already. It's because in Canada, you get 20 minutes with your patient if you're a GP. In England, you get 10, no matter how sick they are. And if you go over that, well, then your clinic gets delayed. In Australia, in New Zealand, you get to spend time operating with your patients and actually seeing them afterwards and telling them how things went, talking to their relatives. In the UK, we don't, because it's a conveyor belt. And Noam Chomsky, I'm sure a lot of you have heard his name, said this quote. He said that that's the standard technique of privatization. Defund, make sure things don't work, get people angry, and then when it's at its lowest, you hand it over to private capital. And I've got to say, if we went the America's way, I'd be rich and I'd have my Porsche. You know, I'd be making 500,000 pounds a year, because in America, a geriatrician can get four to 500,000 pounds a year. So why don't I want privatized NHS? It's because I care for our NHS, because I don't want to go back to the time where people can't afford to go to see a doctor and they've got metastatic cancer and they're in pain. I will say, is this the end? Is this the end of our National Health Service? I implore you, as doctors, we need you guys to protect us to help you. Because without the public support, with the Sun, the Telegraph spouting their utter nonsense, we are going to end up in a real model because your doctors will leave. And it only takes one doctor missing from every shift for the NHS to be, be undeliverable. And 70% of doctors recently polled said, and there was an 8,000 doctor survey, 70% said they would leave the NHS if this contract comes into place. This isn't an idle threat. It's because we're so demoralized. And I will say that we will strike. We will strike not because we like striking, I care nothing more than going in to see my patients. I went in on Boxing Day and New Year's Day, even though I wasn't rotated to go on. I did it for free, and it's because I care. But it wasn't just me. When you're at home for Christmas, there'll be thousands of doctors working in the NHS, because this is what we signed up for. And I promise you this, when it comes to the privatization of the NHS, we cannot let this happen, and we will not let this happen. Thank you very much. Dr. Sandeep Grill, everyone.